As a commercial real estate professional, you manage complicated decisions every day, and to make the right call, you need the full story. Moody's Analytics CRE harnesses the expansive, integrated data and analytical expertise from across the Moody's organization, then curates it specifically for commercial real estate professionals. Learn how to make better decisions and improve CRE workflows with the Moody's Analytics CRE Solution Suite at reese.com. That's R-E-I-S dot com. Welcome to WMRE's Common Area Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning editorial staff at WMRE. Let's jump right into this week's podcast. Hello and welcome to The Common Area with your host, David Bodemer. David, how are you? I'm doing well. We are... Wrapping up 2021 somehow, and it's, um, <laughs> you know, it's been, a, it's been a year. That's right. That's right. We made it. We made it just like we yeah. said through 2020. We're like, good God, we made it. Thank you. Now, I know you've got a, a guest on the show today. Who'd you bring on? So this week we have Eric Birnbaum, who is uh, the president and CEO of Dreamscape Companies. Eric, thank you for, for coming on the podcast. My, my pleasure. So just to get us going, could you give us a quick, just a quick overview on your background and tell us a little bit about the company? Sure. Um, so I, my name is Eric Birnbaum. Um, <clears throat> I founded Dreamscape Companies in the end of 2019. It's a real estate development company, primarily focused on two main verticals, um, one being multifamily residential <clears throat> and the other being hospitality. and we're focused on the gateway markets and the gateway cities within those markets. And my background prior to that was um, I had a company with my old mentor and a guy by the name of Mike Facitelli, who used to be the mm. CEO of Vernado. Mike and I actually, I actually worked at Vernado, just working sort of backwards here. Uh, I worked at Vernado from 2002 ish, I think it was till about 2008. And in 2008, I went off on my own and was also basically doing real estate development in those two main verticals. And then Mike and I partnered up when he left Bernado in 14, all the way through 19. And then we sort of went our separate ways at the end of 19 and hence uh, sort of the, the beginning of Dreamscape, if you will. So that's you know, super interesting timing to be starting a company since the end of 2019. Do you like... Yeah. Like Two or, two or three months before we got into this roller coaster. So what has that been like? You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. We have been actually, you know, we, we've just gotten very lucky in the, in the fact that the deals that we had were either structured in certain specific ways where we weren't as impacted by COVID as many others um, and our peers were. And then on top of that, we were able to take advantage of, I don't, you know, the word distress is really, I think like overused, but mm -hmm. we were able, we were able to take advantage of some opportunities within our spaces where we actually got six or seven deals done, you know, over the past, like call it 18 months or so, which um, in our world is, is, you know, pretty good. And what kind of deals are you doing? You're looking at properties that need to be, uh, repositions? Are you buying, like, wh where do you fit on the kind of that core to distressed spectrum? And what, what do you, what do you, what kind of deals are you doing? And, and what do you do with the deals once you, the properties that you're bringing in? Yeah. I mean, our business is we're, you know, we're, we sort of are in the business of GP and LP um, type of capital where we're the GP mm -hmm. or the general partner. We bring in LP partners into our deals and the types of deals that we predominantly focus on from a risk perspective typically lie somewhere between, you know, call it value add, if you will, all the way mm -hmm. to sort of like opportunistic. So we're typically mm -hmm. trying to generate, you know, depending on where the asset is and the risk profile, um, anywhere between sort of mid to high teens to, you know, hope ideally 20s. Those are very hard to find, but to generate those type of yields and those types of returns, you know, you typically have to put some work into it. So whether you're repositioning, redeveloping, 
and or even developing ground up, that's where we usually find, you know, where, where we're spending most of our time. And you said multifamily and hospitality. Is there like a, a, a breakdown between those two property types? Like 50, as 50 far as, or? No, nah, like I mean, we're, we're, we go where the opportunity is. So, I mean, mm-hmm. we try and focus on those two verticals. And then it's really a function of looking in specific markets and just finding deals that we think make sense um, and then that are, you know, worth spending our time on. And, you know, depending on, the cycle or depending on where the opportunities come from, you may be doing more multifamily residential one year and less hospitality and vice versa. But it, it really is, you know, sort of like case specific. And even in the hospitality world, I mean, there's a whole, obviously, gamut of, of, of types of properties. Is there a specific t- type that you're doing? Are you at the... Yeah. So, I mean, we are, we don't hospital, we've basically do everything other than sort of select services, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we'll do anything ranging from big box, you know, convention oriented hotel assets all the way to sort of like boutique hotel. The one thing that we try and focus on, and, you know, sometimes it's not that easy to do is we rather do a larger deal, if you will, than a smaller deal, just because we have limited, we have a limited team and our resources are you know, sort of finite, the amount of time and energy it takes to do $25 million boutique hotel deal and wherever is takes the same amount of time to do a $200 million deal someplace else. So it, it, it's really about trying to focus on and, and, and really be sort of scru- scrupulous in, you know, return on time. Are you working with um, any particular of the big hotel brands? Like, do you have any preferences or, or you're working with, we, with everybody? I mean, we work with everybody. So yeah. whether it's Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, the, the, the gamut. And you said like, I think there was a mention of, you know, gateway markets. So like, what, what are the, what are your, the markets that you're, you're looking at? Yeah. I mean, gateway I think is probably a misused word. I mean, the, the reality is, is we're looking at, you know, probably the top 30 like MSAs everywhere ranging from kind of like New York on one end to the spectrum and LA all the way to Las Vegas, to Nashville, to New Orleans, to Charleston, you know, some of these emerging kind of drive to markets that you're now seeing have also been an area of focus as well. Sorry, random. Uh- <laughs> tangent yeah. here, but the, the name Dreamscape, wh- where did that come from? It came from our uh, a friend of mine who actually does branding and marketing. Um, and okay. there, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it other than the fact that we kind of both, he, he mentioned it and I was like, yeah, I like that. And that was the end of it. Look at it. It jumps out of it because, you know, most real estate companies are just like, you know, named after a we person didn't have, or, yeah. or like, or like I, I real estate like, capital advisor, you know, like very, yeah, very mean, straightforward kind of names. <laughs> right. So we try and be less straightforward f- for a reason. And I don't know, the, the world has too many stones and, you know, <laughs> lights and yeah. rocks and this and that, so, <laughs> like whatever. <laughs> yeah. There's that whole, right. You know, portraying stability thing, but I think it did. It's a little overkill at this point. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> Yeah, and into, again, so you talked about um, you know you're the GP, you're bringing in LPs. Um, how are you sourcing your capital these days? And and especially given like, you know, it's a little bit hard with with we're kind of in this weird place where people are meeting face to face more, but still not the way it was. So how do you how do you go out and meet your investors and and talk to people about your company and 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 what is that re- and what is that relationship like? We've been doing this for a while. So thankfully, you know, we have, we have great relationships with a sort of myriad of different types of, you know, LPs. And, you know, at this point in our careers, thankfully, you know, a lot of these people are, are our friends that we've done deals with historically. So it's not like we're, we're meeting new people. It's people that mm-hmm. we already know and have, you know, built in relationships with. I think like Zoom you know, for whatever it's worth, I think is a very difficult tool to build a relationship with, but it is a good tool to maintain relationships. Right. So we've been lucky that we've been able to to maintain 
you know, we try and stay in front of, you know, our relationships as, as much as, as much as we can. And they too, I mean, the LPs are in the business of putting out capital. So, you know, were their sort of conduit, if you will, for getting things done. So they, they need us as much as we need them. And when you're talking about your investors, is it like high net worth, family office, institution? What, what is the, what kind of, what kind of investors are you predominantly working with? It's typically, it's not really high net worth. I mean, it's more, mm-hmm. you know, anywhere from large family offices to institutions. Got it. But the fact that you're saying that, like, for the most part, you're dealing with repeat uh, investors sort of speaks to the track record and, and that, that you've built. Yes. Yes. Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, we're sitting here, it's, you know, we're, we're getting towards the end of 2021. What are you looking towards 2022 in terms of just um, the investment climate in general and, and overall, you know, strategies for your company? If we were sitting here at the end of 2020 and you asked me the same question, I, I'd have been wrong. So I know that whatever I say here, I'll probably be wrong too. And so the, the reality is is that none of us know and right. we're in a sort of like unprecedented and uncharted territory where you know we're one newscast away from going back into a lockdown or things going back to normal or nobody really knows and anybody that says they they do is obviously you know full of it you know all we do is we try and con- control like what we can which is you know, keep your head down, plot along, you know, look at deals as they come in and look at them within the prism of the world that we're current, you know, living in at that moment in time and make your best educated decisions that you can make. And I think that um, I have no expectation for 2022, you know, other than you know, we just keep doing the blocking and tackling. And as the deals come, we'll look at them and, and try and be judicious in our decision making. But I, I, but I have no idea where the world is headed. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, if we had this conversation, even like, a, like three weeks ago, would we have known, I forget, I forget when we even heard the word Omicron. And right. then like, there was like the immediately almost seemed like a rape, like, like a, a, another round of, oh no, this is going to be terrible. And then now it seems like we're, oh, maybe it's not going to be so bad, but it's just like, it is, it's like the ground is just like moving underneath us, like from week to week. So I think, I think, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense not to uh, be in the forecasting business right now. (laughs) Yeah, that is, that is for sure. So are there any specific projects that, that you can talk about that, um, that you've done this year or that have closed that, that are would be good for people to, to look at as examples of the of your work. I mean, most of the stuff that we closed this year, like it, I would qualify as everything, as still sort of a work in progress. Because when you're doing repositioning or developing, you know these things don't happen overnight. So you know it's hard to say this is a good example of like a work in a completed work in progress. But when I was at Imperial with Mike Facitelli. A job I'm very proud of that I that I did was the Good Time Hotel in Miami. That was a ground up deal that has gotten you know some good recognition and some good some good press. It's you know one best new hotel in Miami, and you know that is a sort of thing that I that I'm very proud of. As far as stuff that we're in the middle of doing like right now, as far as Dreamscape, you know we bought the Rio Hotel in Las Vegas, um, which is a big okay. asset. We're going to be repositioning that in short order, I hope, and sort of reimagining that, if you will, and bringing that to the market. And, you know, it's going to be a phased in sort of renovation. So that phasing in of the renovation is going to start, we'll probably start seeing the beginnings of it, like in, you know, hopefully 2023. So that's that's exciting and something that we're, we're very focused on. We're doing a big ground up development in Hollywood, which is a big multifamily deal. It's going to be 735 multifamily units. That's on Sunset and Western that we're pretty excited about. So that should be breaking ground and getting through its entitlements, hopefully mid-2022. 
So that's something that we're working on in earnest. We've bought a couple hotels in Nashville um, that we're excited about. We bought a hotel in Charleston that we're excited about. We bought a hotel in Philadelphia and New Orleans that we're excited about. There's no one specific thing. I mean, quite honestly, we're pretty proud of everything we've done. We feel like we have really good projects under our belt. We have a great team and we're just sort of plodding along and, and trying to stay out of trouble. And um, long-term, do you eventually, once these things are stabilized, do you hold or do you, are you looking to sell as soon as the thing is, is, is in, in good, good position? What, what's your, what's your long-term strategy? You know, we're in the business of monetizing promote as the general mm-hmm. partner. Um, once things stable, we usually have a mechanism where we can earn promote. And in many of our deals with many of our partners, they're long-term owners. So we so we can stay on long-term and still get what we call like a crystallization, if you will, of a promote. So it really is case specific and depends on sort of who our LP is and what they want to do. But the ideal scenario for us is to, is, you know, we're not in the business of putting our blood, sweat and tears into stuff and then flipping it, you know, right. to the next guy. We'd like to you know, create value, be recognized for that value creation. And then if it makes sense to hold, we're, we're happy to hold. How much do you leverage the projects in terms of using debt to kind of um, increase the returns? I mean, we're pretty, I mean, conservative, I guess, to, you know, the nature, like we're in that 65 to, Mm -hmm. you know, it's very rare that we go above 70%. So you've got a good amount of equity in these. Yes. Yes. I think we could um, wrap this up. I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and answering my questions and me kind of jumping around a little bit just to keep you on your toes, but uh, I appreciate you rolling with it. But yeah, no, I'm hopefully I, notwithstanding some of the typing, hopefully I answered the questions. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, Eric and David, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming on the show. David, of course, thank you for bringing him on the show. And our last thank you goes to you, listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Common Area Podcast with David Bodemer. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when David comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your colleagues. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at WMRE, this is Eric Johnson inviting you back in two weeks for all the stories that matter to you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Common Area Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of WMRE or Informa. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. As a commercial real estate professional, you manage complicated decisions every day, and to make the right call, you need the full story. Moody's Analytics CRE harnesses the expansive, integrated data and analytical expertise from across the Moody's organization, then curates it specifically for commercial real estate professionals. Learn how to make better decisions and improve CRE workflows with the Moody's Analytics CRE Solution Suite at reese.com. That's R-E-I-S dot com.